Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. It is good to, to see you wherever you are, to be able to tune in with us here at Flag Chapel. It is our joy, and we'll say it every single time, it is our privilege to be able to bring you the good news of the gospel from where we are. And to all of those who are watching, tuning in, streaming with us, remember to, we love your comments, we love your likes, we love your shares. Um, continue to participate. It's one thing that we've been given this grateful opportunity that while we're absent in person, but we have an opportunity to participate online. So otherwise, the word that might be seen by a couple can now just be go very quickly and we can spread the good news. And there's someone who is your friend on Facebook or who follows you on Instagram or who can go to the YouTube channel who needs to hear the word of God. And to think that God had already provided the way for this to happen and that we see his provision in every single thing that we do as the body of Christ and what is not possible without you and for your faithful contributions and your efforts and your gifts and your time. And we want to say thank you to never overlook you, overlook your dedication and to continue to be a part of what God is doing. And we want to say thank you. I want to say a personal thank you to all of the well wishes that I received on my graduation on last week. Uh, definitely feel the love from you, which is part of my church family and the body of Christ. It, it truly would not have been possible without all of your prayers, without all of your thoughts, without all of your well wishes, without your gifts. Um, thank you for these past four years of support that you have given me, and it has been my joy to, to drive from Statesboro, Georgia, to be with you and to see what God is doing among you. So thank you. You didn't have to do it, but out of the kindness of your heart, you're, you did. And so let us pray, and then we'll get into the word. Dear God, thank you for this day. God, thank you for the word, the logos of God, which you have given to us as a testimony of your goodness and who you are. God, I pray in this moment that you will remove me completely. I'm a frail, imperfect, fragile vessel of clay. God, breathe in now your spirit into this dirt. Allow me to speak a word that someone might hear it. If they already know you, that their journey might be strengthened and that they will be able to hold on and progress in their faith and their walk with you get to see a snippet of who you are more god if they do not know you god i pray that they will come to to know your son jesus christ and believe on his death and his resurrection and his coming again god thank you for these precious moments that we get to spend in your presence god allow whatever is said or done to move beyond just this hour on sunday morning but allow it to move into our Monday, our Tuesday, our Wednesday, our Thursday, our Friday, our Saturday, our Sunday. God, allow us to break out of the cycle of repetition. God, allow us to see the new and the great and the mighty things that you are continually doing for us every single day. God, do not allow us to overlook the little miracles. Don't allow us to overlook your faithfulness, God, of what you are doing in our lives. And it seems repetitive, seems we say the same things, but God, you keep on doing great things for us and in our lives, with our family and our friends. And God, we thank you. We praise you. 
and we worship you and it's in jesus name that we pray and we say amen if you have your bibles i'm excited this morning for the word if you have your bibles turn your phones or your tablets to the book of acts and we're going to be in acts chapter 4 and we're going to be reading verses 3 through 14. Acts chapter 4, verses 3 through 14. We get this Sunday morning to look at the beginning point of the church. It's the beginning point of Jesus' death and his crucifixion and his resurrection. And now Jesus has left the very people who he called. Jesus has left the very people who are fishermen and told to now be fishers of men. And we're going to see in the text this morning how and what ways is that possible to be fishers of men and what that means. So Acts chapter 4, verses 3 through 14. And the Bible reads, And they arrested them, talking about Peter and John, and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening, but many of those who had heard the word believed. And the number of men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Anas, Anais, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power, by what power, or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised, you crucified, but God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved now when they saw this is the key when they saw the boldness of peter and john and perceived that they were uneducated common men they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with jesus but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them they had nothing to say in opposition amen for the time that is ours this morning i want to preach from the subject line i am the story i am the story i am the story the content of the story is me it is my life it is the testimony that make up the story i am the story here in Acts chapter 4, we're going to run into two separate stories that are being told in the text. Because like we know in Acts 1, Jesus has left the disciples and they are standing there astonished. They are looking in amazement and they are looking in wonder at the spectacular thing that God has done. That Jesus was not only killed, but also resurrected and brought back to life. But then they saw him ascend on a cloud into heaven and the disciples are left staring into the sky because they do not fully understand what is going on. And the angel comes and asks them the question, why are you still looking? Now, this propels and begins their next steps because it is one thing for us to see the thing that God does so evidently in our life. But oftentimes we can get left staring at what God has done. And what do I mean by called staring at what God has done? We stare at what God has done in our life and we can stare at the miracles and the things that God has done for us in astonishment and the power of Jesus Christ. 
Christ to save us, a lot of us can get left staring at salvation. What do you mean? We can get left staring and awestruck in the fact that God would do something amazing enough to pour out his grace and his mercy to us and to save our souls. And yet we know that it is by nothing that we have done to deserve his goodness and his mercy. And yet for some reason he sent his son to die for us. And then we get left staring at the fact of what God has done for salvation. Then we concentrate on ourselves. We wonder about how how our performance is we wonder about are we doing the things are we looking the part of what a christian ought to look like are we living up to the billing of making it sure that we were worthy of being saved and we get left staring at the process of salvation when in actuality you're to be saved the bible says for good works you're not meant to be left standing in awe of the fact that God saved you, but then you ought to ask the question, why did God save me? And God did not save you so you could look the part of a typical Christian. He saved you so that you could be his ambassador in the world and impact the community around you, impact your family members around you, impact your church, impact your city. So if you are left standing at the fact that you have been saved and yet you have not participated in the process of changing somebody's world and bringing in the kingdom of God I need to wake you up and ask you the question what are you staring at because Jesus is gone and the disciples they said what are you looking for he's gone he's not here it's time for you to be about the mission in which he entrusted you with so how do they do that? They go, and in Acts chapter 2, we get the Pentecost. We get that the Holy Spirit comes down in fire, and it drops on them, and they are able to speak in other tongues. They are able to show the signs and the wonders of what the Holy Spirit does, and they are now empowered. So Jesus, who promised them another one would come, and that unless I go, he cannot come. That means that this one who is with them must be very powerful and strong, that that Jesus is willing to leave them so that they can be empowered. They are willing to be go out on their own and Jesus is willing to go back to the Father because he knows that in order for them to carry out the mission and in order for the gospel to spread, Jesus has to be gone so that they can trust in the deposit that God has placed within them. The question for us today is do we believe that we are in a good position and in good hands with the Holy Spirit that having the Holy Spirit within us that we have been saved and now that the God who we believe in who died on the cross Jesus in human flesh now we have the Spirit within us the Holy Spirit that we are able to do the things as if Jesus Emmanuel was here with us but now we have the spirit within us which will never leave us and do we believe in the power that now is with inside of us but if you look at a lot of our lives and you look at a lot of what we're going through and you look at a lot of our situations, I would say the answer is no. I would say the answer is do we believe that God has really deposited something within us would be no because look at our family life. Look at our situations. Look at I can tell by your conversations if you truly believe that you have the power of God within you. When you step onto your job on Monday morning, tomorrow, you have the power of God. God within you, the power to speak life and death in the situations, the power to see that it might not be the best of days, but that there's still a word from the Lord to be spoken, that you have the power within you to be able to speak the gospel to someone who might not want to hear it or believe it, but you have power of truth, the evidence of do you believe now God is going to put you in a situation to see if you truly trust him to do what he said. It's one thing for the Holy Spirit to be there and for them to speak in tongues. But then we move into Acts chapter 3. And now they have the opportunity because they come to the temple at the hour of prayer. And what God does is that God sets it up so that they have a situation where they have to trust. There's somebody who's listening to me that it's one thing for you to say that you trust God. It's one thing for you to say that you believe God is able. But now God's getting ready to bring 
bring you into a situation to test if you really trust him for who he says he is. You say that you believe, and I know that some of you, the disciples, have been scared. You've been running. You've been hiding. You've locked yourself in upper rooms. But now you're going to run into a situation where you truly can see if you really believe that God is who he says he is and that God will do what he said he will do. And the pro and the place that you're going to run into the problem is not out at a party. It's not in your house, but it's at church. Mm. Now, this is the problem for a lot of us because we want problems to arise everywhere else but church. We want, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with problems because we expect problems to come up in other areas and we expect problems to be with those people who don't know Jesus and we expect problems to be, but, but how dare there be a problem and an issue at the church house? How, how dare there be somebody at church who doesn't have their life all together? How dare there be somebody at church that isn't a, a tither? How dare there be somebody at church who doesn't know Jesus like I know Jesus? How dare there be somebody who, who's watching who does not understand what God is doing in their life? How dare there be anything that would make what God is doing look unappetizing or unattractive? But the thing is, when God gives you the power of the Holy Spirit, the best place to meet a problem and the best place for a broken person to be is at the door on the way to the house of God. So when you come to the house of God, it teaches you and trains you that you should not come in here to be a consumer, but you ought to come in here ready to be a producer of the good works of Jesus Christ. It is the problem why why some people can look at the church being closed and then feel like church has been canceled. It's the problem why people can feel like I'm not gathering in church. I'm no longer a church member, so I shouldn't tithe. If you have that mindset, it means that the Holy Spirit that is within you is sitting dormant and not working because you have looked at it as what you can get when the Holy Spirit is inside of you saying, I'm ready to do. It is a spirit inside of you that's saying, I'm ready for you to step in and meet the need. I'm ready for you to understand that church is not a place you go. It is who you are. I'm waiting for you to understand that I have put my spirit within you and you can meet the need to Tell yourself, I can meet the need. I can meet the need because of the power that is within you. So the Bible says that they go to the temple at the hour of prayer, and there is a man who is lame there begging, and he asked them, do they have any money? Do they have anything? And Peter and John say the famous verse, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have to you, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. It, it is the first time that with authority we see that the disciples are willing to use the name Jesus Christ. And because they use that name, the man is healed and he gets up. But there is not a pleasant crowd for the miracle. The miracle happens and we get to Acts chapter 4 and everybody is not happy about the miracle. Everybody is not happy about what is taking place. And we see here in chapter 4 that in verse 3, they arrested them and put them in custody in verse 4. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. So they performed the miracle, but because of the miracle, they are thrown in prison. But even though they are thrown in prison and they are the ones being punished, the Bible says that people still came to know Jesus Christ. Now the question is, what are you willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel? What are you willing? Because Paul would list out to us that he was willing to suffer beaten and being shipwrecked. And he was willing to suffer trials and tribulations for the sake of the gospel. But today in Western civilization, we live at a time where we have comfortable Christianity. We have comfortable Christianity where if anything comes up to where serving God is inconvenient to you, then you no longer want to do it. If, if it's difficult for you to serve, you don't want to serve. I, I, it's uncomfortable for you to, to have a gospel conversation. So instead of doing it and getting over yourself, you'll decide not to do it because you don't want to get made fun of or you don't want to get talked about. You don't want to be labeled as the Christian person at your job. 
You don't want to be labeled as the Christian student at your school. So because you care more about what people think about you, you rather have these people not know who Jesus is and go to hell. We don't like to look at it that way, but think about it. If you don't share the gospel and you have the good news and you have a treasure that is worth more than anything in the world and you refuse to share it with somebody else, then you are fine with letting that person live an eternity separated from God. How much must you hate a person to have eternal life? and not offer it to them how much how, how much must you dislike somebody to know jesus christ to know what he can do for your life and yet because you don't want to be uncomfortable you will go thinking that well maybe somebody else will tell them maybe they'll get it from somebody else but what if God has placed you in that position around that person for the specific reason of them getting to know Jesus Christ and the disciples were put in jail, arrested and put in prison, but people came to know who Jesus was and it was worth it. It was worth it. I came to tell you this Sunday morning that everything that you will go through for the sake of the gospel is worth it. Everything that you will endure for the sake of the gospel is worth it. He, he wrote, Paul wrote that it is for our momentary and light afflictions that pale in comparison to the future glory. It's worth it. Them talking about you at school is worth it. Them not sitting with you at lunch is worth it. Them sitting there and talking behind your back is worth it. Them scheming and plotting against you is worth it you getting fired is worth it you not knowing where your next meal is coming from is worth it because he will look out for you he will take care of you he will provide you if he clothes the lilies of the field which are here today and gone tomorrow how much more will he clothe you if he watches over the sparrow how much more will he provide for you i'm not worried about a job i'm worried about salvation i'm not worried about my relationship and and how you feel about me in the moment because when you come to know the Christ that I know and how he can change your life you will come to love me because you realize that I love you and I can only love you because he first loved us he he God himself loved us so much that he did not withhold his only son so why would we withhold the good news of the gospel they said that they were arrested. And then in verse 5, chapter 4, verse 5, he says, On the next day, the rulers and the elders and the scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, all who were the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they, they took John and Peter and they put them in the midst of the people of the crowd. They, they basically put them on a semi-trial. And the Bible said they asked them one question, by what power or by what name did you do this see it is it is a question of authority by what power that means capability and by what name means by what endorsement See, there's two questions in a factor in your life when you have a situation. It will be the question of, are you capable and do you have the endorsement to do it? When you're on a job, they're going to ask, how are you going to do it? And then who will be funding your project? Anybody in the business world knows that these are two things that you're going to have to face. The question of the how and the who. And they ask them a very logical question of how and who. Now, the question that they ask them, they're not ready for the answer because the question in your life should also be by what power and by what name. And this will help a lot of us because the problem with our lives and the reason why they're going how they're going is because we have a lot of self-funded and self-endorsed plans. Yeah, I know you don't want to admit it. I know you don't want to say yeah, that's me. I know you don't want to nod your head. But yeah, you have a lot of self-endorsed and self-funded plans. Plans that you did not consult God on. Plans you did not pray about. 
people you're dating that you definitely did not pray about jobs that you did not ask God for and you get on it and you wonder why your hair's turning gray you wonder why you don't want to go in on Monday morning you wonder why you can't stand the person you wake up in the bed with it's because you had a self-funded and a self-endorsed plan and there's one thing that I know about my God he will only fund the plans that he puts into motion so when it starts falling apart that might be a sign that it was something that you wanted all along we we must move away from these self-endorsed and self-funded plans because the problem with those is that when those plans fail and fall through the only thing that is left holding them up is you and the problem with the plan being held up by you and your plan being funded by you is that it can't be held up by you because you're not sovereign enough see for something to be held up and supported and and be the strength must be there you must have the, the strength to be able to hold it up but the only one who has the strength to hold up anything is god and when you try to hold things up, you realize very quickly that you really don't have that much strength at all. And then when you try to self-fund the plan, you realize that you're actually pretty bankrupt. That you really don't have much spiritually there to be able to hold up the pressure, to hold up the anxiety, to hold up from the stress. So your self-funded and your self-endorsed plan cannot hold up and you end up being insufficient. So then what happens is, instead of realizing that it was a you plan all along, you pretend that it was a God plan and then get mad at God that it didn't work out. God, help me not get mad at you for things that you did not do. I'm about to free somebody this morning. You're getting ready to stop getting mad at God for things that he did not do and plans he did not have a part in and relationships he did not set up. You're getting ready to stop getting mad and blaming God. All of your church hurt and all of the reasons you keep blaming God when it was really you and the self that you could not support it. And they said, by what power or by what name? And then the Bible says in verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and people and elders, He said, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? See, they were on trial for a good work. They were on trial for a good work. Now the thing about God-funded plans and God-funded purpose is that there will be a good God at the center, which means the action will be something good. See, every good and perfect gift comes from God. God is incapable of doing something other than good. Now, what you define it as is different than what God calls it. Because you look around the world and you see brokenness and you see sadness and you see grief and you see death and you see disaster. But when my God formed the creation of the world out of the words of his mouth and spoke everything into existence, the only thing he could say was, it is good. And then you look at yourself and all you do when you look in the mirror is you hate yourself. You hate the way you look. You think you're overweight. You think you're too skinny. You hate. You think you're too dark skinned. You think you're too light skinned. You think your hair is too nappy. You think it's too straight. But when God looked at you, when he created you, all he could say was it is very good that you are beautifully and wonderfully made. So what you might call something, God has already called it something else. So I'm going to start going by what God has said about it. You, you, we got to stop labeling our situations. Something that what God has not labeled it. Because the beauty of Romans 8.28 that tells us that all things work together for the good of those who love God. And are called according to his purpose. So if the action has been done by a person who loves God. And the action and the plan is being carried out for a good purpose. 
then that means that all things work together for the good. Which means that each individual thing might not feel good. Each individual action might not seem good. But when he gets done adding it all together. See, when he gets done making the dirt. And he gets done making the arm. And he gets done making a leg. And when he gets done planting the tree. And when he gets done making a leaf. And when he gets done making the zebra. And when he gets done making the stars. And when he gets done making the sun. See, while well, the potter's at the wheel, it doesn't look too pretty. But when he gets done molding. Is there anybody in here that you're just in the process of goodness coming together? You're in the process of his goodness and his mercy. You're in the process of the process where God is getting ready to show you that everything will work together. He said, you're, you're putting us on trial for good. If you were to ask anybody in your life and ask the people who don't even believe in God, the only thing that God has a question to ask you is how can you put me on trial for good? <laughs> when Job asked, could I plead my case to him? And God gave Job his opportunity to talk. And when he got done talking and God said, are you finished? She said, yeah. God said, all right, it's my turn. Let me speak. He said, were you there? <laughs> he said, were you there when I created the foundations of the earth? He said, were you there when I made oxygen molecules coming to existence that you could even have the very breath that you're breathing in your body? He said, were you there when I formed the Leviathan in the depths of the sea and when I put the birds in the sky? Were you there? Because everything that I'm doing is good and it's of God. And there's somebody that you're not sure if you can trust in God and you're not sure if you can believe in God. But I came with full certainty this morning that the God that were you there when he made it possible for you to even be a living, breathing soul? Were you there when he made it possible for you to have your name before your mother even knew you were in her womb? Were you there when he created the sun and the moon and the stars so he has the right to do? Do you question the goodness of God? They said, are you questioning the goodness because we're on trial because of what God has done. When you look into the world and you're not sure how you can answer them, the questions about whether God exists or whether God is good, the answer to the question is that God only does good things. God only does good things. And we see here that the man who is paralyzed now can walk. And Peter said, you are putting us on trial for something good. People continually try to put God on trial when all God has done has been good. All God has done is shown you grace and mercy. All God has done is looked out for you. All God has done is take care of your family. All God has done was wake you up this morning. All God has done was make sure you had food on the table. All God has done was look after you. And yet for some reason you still don't trust him. All he has done was make sure that you had hair on your head and that they were numbered. And yet you still don't trust him. All he did was make sure that your footsteps were ordered. And yet you still don't trust him. All he did was make sure that you made it through the valley of the shadow of death. And fear no evil. Yet you still don't trust him. All he did was prepare a table in the presence of your enemy yet you still don't trust him all he did was wake you up and yet you still don't believe in his goodness he said well if that's not enough peter said in verse 10 let it be known to all of you and all the people of israel that by the name of jesus christ peter said i've already used the name once I can know with certainty that I'll use it again. <laughs> See, it's one thing when you've been walking with God, that now you've learned that it doesn't matter what the situation is. You already know who he is. It doesn't matter whether Peter was walking up to the lame man to get, tell him to rise up and walk, or whether he was given the defense of his trial. He already had confidence in the name of Jesus Christ. And the question is, are you confident in the name of Jesus Christ? That no matter what the situation looks like right now, you can call on his name. 
It doesn't matter what, how bad the debt is, you can still call on his name. It doesn't matter what stage the cancer is, you can still call on his name. It doesn't matter how many years of the sentence they got in prison, you can still call on his name. It doesn't matter if the marriage is in divorce court, you can still call on his name. You've learned that it doesn't matter what it is. I got a who that surpasses all the what. I got a who when I'm sleepless. I got a who when I'm in anxiety. I got a who when I'm depressed. I got a who for when I'm broke. I got a who for when I'm lonely. And if I got a who, I can make it through the what. He said, it's at the name of Jesus of Nazareth whom you crucify he said is that the name that you thought you got rid of he see Peter started talking with some swagger he started talking and saying it's the name that you thought that you could get rid of by putting them in a grave he said the name of Jesus so you thought you could hold a body down but not even the grave could hold his body. And then he said, I know you're sitting here looking at how I'm speaking with you. And the thing is now, I got power to use the name. I don't even need his body. Because now he sits at the right hand of God the Father. Now he intercedes on behalf of the people on earth. So now I don't even need to show you a table. I can't show you not a single table that Jesus built. I can't show you a single wedding feast that he went to. I can't show you a cup that he drank wine from. I can't show you the bread that he broke at the table. I cannot show you the sandals he wore on his feet. I cannot show you the robe that he had on his shoulders. I cannot show you for certainty the word on which he was crucified. I cannot show you the tomb in which he was buried. But I got a name that's above every name. That's all I need is the name of Jesus. I don't need any more facts. I don't need any more fairy tales. I got a name. Crawl on his name and watch it turn around for you is the disciples to see to show now what the power of the Holy Spirit is that no longer did it have to be physically present with them but now the power was inside of them and for somebody this morning you're you're realizing that now that the power was never in a place I don't know who I'm talking to, but the power was never in the address. The power was never in the beautiful steeples and cathedrals. The power was never in the parking spot that was your favorite. The power was never in the pew. But the power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now within you. It's not about the physical anymore. It's about the spiritual. It's, it's about what is within you. God has equipped us for times like these. He has equipped you for being on your job. He has equipped you for being in your school. He has equipped you. Jesus did not leave them until he gave them the promise of what would be inside of them. Jesus does not set you up to do and fulfill his mission if he has not given you everything you need to fulfill it. Some of you are waiting on something and it's not going to come because you already have everything that you need. You already have everything that you need. I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about resources. I'm not talking about the job. 
I'm talking about you have the power of the Holy Spirit within you. You have everything that you need. It's no more wishing and waiting. It's now working and doing. No more wishing and waiting. It's working and doing. There is no tomorrow you got now. And the Holy Spirit is working on you. To say, God, I believe. God, I trust you. Because the thing about the Holy Spirit is, is something that you cannot see. But you have to believe that he's working in you. And then my favorite part of the verse, because I told you, I am the story. The first story of evidence was the man who was lame and can now walk. And that it was nobody but Jesus who did that for him. But he's not the only stories to be told in the chapter. The second and third I am the story is Peter and John. Because in verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. See, the story that is meant to be told of a person who has encountered Jesus is the story of your life. It's one thing to tell a story with your lips. It's another thing to repeat a story that you've heard from somebody else. But when you are a living witness of the story. See, there, there's somebody who's listening to me. You're, you're trying to figure out the point of all this pain. You're trying to figure out the point of all of your frustration. You're trying to figure out the point of all this struggling. You struggle, your mom struggle, your grandparents struggle. And you're trying to figure out what is the point of all this. What is the point of Jesus being crucified what is the point of us sleeping on dirt floors what was the point of us not having anything in the bank account the point is that when people encountered John and Peter they knew that they had been with Jesus the story that you will tell is your life And the way that you will tell that story is by spending time with Jesus and letting him completely change who you are into something that you could not become on your own. That's my favorite part of the text is that they looked at them and they saw that they were nobodies. They saw that they were common, uneducated people. Somebody that sounds a lot like your story. You know that you're nobody special. You know that you come from a place that nobody cares about. You know that you, because of your life and your family situations where you had to work and support your family, that you were not able to go and achieve all the accolades and the, edu- the education status, the, the bachelors, the masters, the doctorates. That's not your story. But the thing is that what God wants to do through you does not take a degree. It does not take a graduation. What God wants to do through you does not take classes. It does not take sitting. What God wants to do through you is you being available to him and saying yes and when you get done saying yes and being available people will look at you and think that you are greater than you really are because of what God is doing through you that's the testimony your life ought to look like a life of someone who's been with Jesus your life ought to look like the story of somebody who's been with Jesus When you look back over your life and all is said and done, can you say that I live life with Jesus? And I show that I've lived life with Jesus by how I impact others around me. Jesus did not call Peter from being a fisher of fish to a fisher of man just so he could be holy and saved and sanctified. 
but the original purpose in which God called Peter was so that he could be fisher of men you have a original purpose as to why God has chosen to reveal himself to you and you have come into relationship with him and I, I'm sorry to burst your bubble it's not so that you can know all the worship songs it's not so that you can be the biggest tither in your church that's good and God uses that and blesses that it's not so you can have the title of deacon or deaconess steward or stewardess trustee but he saved you with the purpose knowing that if I can get this one, there is a community and there is a city and there is a county and there is a job and there is a family that can be impacted by this person. If I can, if I can get them to buy in, to know that I'm everything they'll ever need, and if I can get them to put down their nets in which they've been chasing fame and chasing being a celebrity and chasing income and chasing wealth, if I can get them to just put down those nets and pick up the nets I have for them to make them fishers of men they will be able to bring in all the people around them and that is why Jesus saves us for good works are you allowing God to fulfill his purpose through you because if you're not spreading the gospel to someone else and you're not helping those around you you're not fulfilling the purpose of God and like we said, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good when you love him and you're being called according to his purpose. That's when you will see things working together in your life. It's when you make your life not just about you. When you make your life about those around you and when you continually pour out your life in service to everyone else that is when you will see all these broken puzzle pieces that seem like to be the fractures of your life that is when you will see them all come together because you say god i love you and i want to be called according to your purpose and i want to work for you god work through me your spirit in me and there's somebody in here that may be the step of having the Holy Spirit is your next step because you need to come and know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. As Lord of your life and leader of your life, that he died for you and was resurrected for you and was enough for these men to be willing to die for. Come meet a man who died for you so that you can live for him. And then those of you who already know him, the next steps for you is to, to, to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to impact the world around you. And we're going to pray. God, thank you for this day. God, thank you for the story that you are telling. God, each and every one of us have given the opportunity to have a story of our lives. We have a story of how we come to know you and how you have completely shattered everything that we thought we knew. God, thank you for seeing a fragile vessel of clay and yet choosing to want to deposit your Holy Spirit within it. God, I pray that you will give us ample opportunities to be the church. God, don't allow us just to go to church, attend church, but God, put people in need in our path so we can have opportunities to be the church. And God, I pray when those opportunities arise, we will use the power of your Holy Spirit to do the very works which you have already set out before the foundation of the world for us to do. The good works that you want us to walk in, God, I pray that we'll do that. God, continue to allow our vision and our focus to be on you. God, please endorse your plans and fund your plans for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. God, it is by no other name that man can be saved. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Confucius. God, not by new age thinking, not by positive thinking, God, not by meditation, but God, it is by one name and one name alone. And God, I pray that someone who might not know you will call on the name of Jesus Christ right now. It is by that name that man must be saved. God, thank you for your saving power and your saving grace. God, be with us. God, empower us. God, strengthen us. God, protect us. God, lead us. And God, guide us. 
And it is in your mighty, magnificent, marvelous name that we do pray. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Thank you again for joining and tuning in with us. May God bless you, bless this day, bless the rest of your week. And remember the reason in which God has called you to fulfill your purpose. So continue to walk in that. We love you. God bless you is our prayer. We'll see you next time.